I woke up at 2 a.m. in the back of a Walmart parking lot just outside Cody, Wyoming. Halogen lights seeped in through fog windows as I adjusted my makeshift nest of old t-shirts. Trying to sleep in the rental minivan filled with everything I owned, comfort was cocaine sprinkled in a snowstorm, impossible to find. I felt safer seeing two RVs that pulled in nearby and stumbled back to sleep. It was May 2020, in the heart of the pandemic, and I was on my way across the country on hold. I just spent the last 72 days in an apartment by myself in a city I moved to only three months earlier. With each day, it looked more and more like I was about to befriend a volleyball or cut up my license to live on a bus in Alaska. A distant look was hazing my eyes. So I called my landlord, broke my lease, packed up all my things, and moved back as the world held still. That next morning, I pulled back out onto empty, sprawling highways. Most people don't travel when the air's out to get them. On road trips like these, as miles reach into the thousands, time starts to work differently. It's like a doctor's waiting room, and the trick is to never look at the clock. So music's out. Every time the song stops, the illusion is broken. You need to get lost inside a story. As a chapter shut closed in my rearview mirror, wondering what brought me to this moment, I found myself listening to a show with an equally unique take on time. One that wrangles with the past in a way like no other. From Gimlet Media, I'm Jonathan Goldstein, and this is Heavyweight. Today's episode, James. Heavyweight is a show by Jonathan Goldstein and Gimlet Media, where Jonathan helps people dive into unsettled parts of their lives that weigh on them in a funny, dryly mischievous, but profound way. You know, maybe I could do something to help. Okay, here we go. In the show, past and present weave together and are challenged to face each other in some poorly fixed metaphorical boxing match. You're like a nightmare therapist who causes fights. People seeking apologies, validation, forgiveness, atonement, self-confidence, or a laugh. He tells me that the episode actually destroyed his father's oldest friendship. Jonathan plays the part of sleuth, detective, comedian, commentator, therapist, and champion for the revival of the word Inter- interlo- interlocute, right? No, you're an interlocutor. An early episode is a haphazard misadventure of the man who gave Moby a CD that Moby then sampled, trying to track him down for credit. I phoned back to remind Gregor how last season my show repaired his friendship with noted vegan and bald-headed techno musician Moby. In the sense that you forced me into it, like probably one of the top three most awkward afternoons of my life. So it was a little, it was a little awkward in the room, but in the end, no, it wasn't a little awkward. <laughs> it was incredibly awkward. Others included an awkward roller skater banned from his favorite pizza shop. I found myself like making sure I could, you know, have something to say, like preparing something for the quick interaction while I buy my pizza. Like what kind of thing? I don't know, like if it's raining out, I would have something clever to say about that, or... Give me an example of the clever thing that you would say when it was raining. I'd say, oh man, bummer, and this is not rollerblading weather. There's the story of a mistake in a Russian masterpiece no one cares about but Jonathan. Imagine you're the only person in an ensemble of 4,000 people who who, uh, fucks up their moment. It's a formal excuse to dig up the past and see if it's worthwhile. And while I was running from a past into an uncertain future, I found peace in this man dedicating himself to meaning in the messiness. It was so good. It was so cool. Yeah, I think he genuinely forgave me. And I did it all on my lonesome. No, you didn't. You needed so much help. A couple months ago, one of you commented asking if I talk about podcasts on this channel, which is much better than TikTok, where I just get told I look like beans. Podcasts are an interesting challenge in the video essay world where visual artifacts are the bedrock. The visuals are all in your head. But Heavyweight instantly came to mind and with this little podcast renaissance we've entered, I want to make sure it gets its due. A reminder that it's not all just retrofitted late night shows or, you know, pseudo intellectual club comics telling 20 million people they're being silenced. When it's the 20s and companies start shelling out tens of millions of dollars for radio again, they can't blame me for looking around for Orson Welles. I have a soft spot for storytelling for shows. Not necessarily a War of the Worlds type narrative, but give me a human interest, this American life, and I'd shell out some serious tote bag money. I grew up on them. They're my parents' old Camry defrosting in the driveway on a November morning before school. They're the smell of coffee I hadn't grown a taste for yet. And Goldstein and Heavyweight in particular represent the best of it today. It can make you laugh, cry, it's silly and profound. His episode Barbara was nominated this year for the IDA Documentary Awards. But as the Mill episode shows, it's not for everyone. Sidney hated the podcast so much that he sent Milt a letter 
formally ending their 65-year friendship. But personally, I like that it doesn't hide its point of view. The show's focus is on interpersonal relationships, and so Jonathan brings you in on his own. If I'm going to trust someone to walk me through the past of others, I like knowing how they see the world. Every episode starts with a phone call between Jonathan and his friend Jackie Cohen, where he playfully wastes her time until she hangs up. You're not listening as usual. The floor is yours. I'm listening. John? Yeah. He parodies his own insecurities and quirks, self-deprecating to let the main story shine. Hating my writing and myself, it felt good to direct my critical gaze outward for a while. He creates his producer into a character of tongue-in-cheek greed, as if a local radio producer is on par with the Monopoly man. Why do you need money? Alex Bloomberg asks while picking his teeth clean of chia seeds. Goldstein never once pretends to be judge, jury, and executioner. He's a host through his own worldview with his fingerprint all over the stories. Even when they don't go his way, he includes that people disagree and are often confused with his pursuits. It seems like it really bothers you. I'm sorry, but that's, I mean, what can I say? I mean, that's not been a big issue. People that don't answer his calls or think that the past should stay where it is. The Marshall episode is a story of every single person being confused by his slightly neurotic disappointment in a movie's subtle mistake. Everyone wholeheartedly disagreeing with his idea that a violinist breaking the fourth wall would ruin a one-shot accomplishment like Russian Ark. You are more bothered by it than I am. Um, I've actually never heard a live audience notice it. In an interview with Alexander Sakharov, the director says on the side to his translator. He asked me, he's like, don't translate that. But uh, what's up with this obsession with one little thing? Jonathan lets us know not everyone's on board, which makes me trust him to guide us through the story. I know where he stands. In spite of calling myself an artist, I'm no Sakharov. I'm not even a Tillman Butner. I am the violinist. I've always thought that critics should post their baggage next to their bylines with any poor reviews. Like, reviewed by James, who was once dumped by a Mitski fan, so every album reminds him of his own heartbreak, which is why this gets a 6 out of 10. Great. I'll trust what you write more than somebody who academicizes opinion as fact. Because now I know how to interpret it. There's too much chaos for absolutes. I'm skeptical of anyone pretending they're not winging it like the rest of us. Video essays themselves fall off when they start feeling like a textbook. I want you all to know that this is me exploring how I see the world by diving into why parts of culture call to me. I hope you get something out of it, but that's what I'm here for. Heavyweight storytelling is something I aspire to. A goalpost where I think the craft of this channel can head. Taking cultural touchstones as a starting point to weave a narrative out of seemingly nothing. From the past to explore meaning in absurd places. Of course, I only say that last part to myself. The last thing I need is to be exiled back to Canada to wander sub-zero streets while drinking frozen milk from a bag, dancing for Canadian nickels and begging strangers for podcasting opportunities. Similar to Jonathan, I see this as a formal excuse to ask the questions I've always had. A storyteller is a travel guide. Compare the faceless barrage of top 10 lists telling you a trip to Paris is dog shit unless you went to XYZ restaurant. Compare that to Anthony Bourdain. We remember Bourdain because he takes us where he wants to go and lets us decide on our own if that's what we'd like out of this. What he loves and hates are worn on his sleeve. He presents a perspective to react to rather than claiming absolute authority. Goldstein carries that torch, striking the right balance of humor and heart and placing himself right inside each story to give us a touchstone. And here I am, an impolite dinner guest pointing out a sauce stain on the 90-minute long, single-take tablecloth everyone's so proud of. Sometimes it's flawed, but in the specific, you find the universal. Proof that meaning and stories come from everywhere when you know where to look. Great storytelling changes where you pay attention. It makes you look at everyone you pass as the keeper of a story sprawling and world-consuming, just waiting for the right person to ask and uncover. There's a quote from the Hank Green of the 2000s that goes, Everyone you will ever meet knows something you don't. And while that's doe-eyed and a poetic way to look at it, Goldstein does it in a grounded way. His tone is sardonic, self-deprecating, acknowledging the absurdity of the endeavor, but still going forward with it anyways. He's hopeful in spite of his cynicism. He overthinks, but acts. He embodies that delving into the past is an act of contradictions. I'm not sure if it's blind faith and secrets to larger questions being hidden in plain sight, a desire to find peace in the present by altering the past, or a compulsion of curiosity. But either way, his obsession with the past brings us a thing of beauty. 
It's like a good story from an old relative. It might make you laugh, cry, roll your eyes, but then something is revealed, and the once familiar feels profound. Heavyweight is often about a convergence, whether by force or by chance, its past meeting present, and seeing what new comes from the collision. In an episode about two sides of a car accident, Goldstein weaves together the story with this idea of two lines intersecting. Only one line has to alter its course, even the tiniest bit, and eventually, two parallel lines will meet. It could take forever, only happening at some theoretical infinity point, or it could take four years and happen in a Portland hotel room. It's a beautiful metaphor, the randomness of life and how often it comes down to chance intersections. That's the power of the show. Jonathan is there, pushing the lines together so that they meet sooner. And though what we're seeing is simply a point in a larger picture, there's beauty in that meeting. Even the most experimental of short videos can only show what lies within the frame, not what lies outside of it. Heavyweight offers a glimpse, a chance to see someone for a moment, to remember that each of us carry the weight of our past, even if all that remains is the feeling, to know that peace with our own path is possible. It's small, but something niche and overlooked often holds something profound and universal. Every episode of Heavyweight ends with the song Sun in an Empty Room by The Weaker Lands. And with it, the exact to a T feeling of the show is captured with a glimpse of a verse and a chorus. It's about a life that belongs to you alone the moment the front door to a former home closes one final time. Boxes packed, last month's rent scheming with the damage deposit, looking out on the physical reminder of a past that shaped you moving on. It's been two and a half years since I drove down those empty highways to heavyweight and into uncertainty. Two and a half years since I stood in the doorway, looking out at sun pouring into my own empty room, the soft light of potential washing away my nostalgia. Since then, time has warped, blurred, flattened, and I've changed. The next tenants will see a blank slate where I saw a novel, and I'm reminded that we are one story of many, a masterpiece, drawn on an etch-a-sketch, bound to shake clean from one final slam of the door. And then, the story will begin again. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe for more video essays on the overlooked art and culture that makes this weird, strange mess worthwhile.